Welcome to this Continuum Lab Clixophone build video and tutorial. The Clixophone is a MIDI instrument made using the Continuum Lab instrument kit. It's a highly capable woodwind instrument emulator with fingerings based on a saxophone, several types of mouthpiece options and uh, various optional functions such as extra keys and pitch bend. But even with all that, the Clixophone can be made using very simple techniques and materials, which is what I'm going to show you in this video. We'll start by proving that, as I always say, looks aren't everything. And we'll do that by making this extremely simple cardboard prototype, which looks like a bit of a joke, but which works exceedingly well. After that, we'll take the Clixophone to the next level by incorporating uh, 3D printed parts and trying out uh, various types of mouthpiece and breath sensors on this other model. This video is kind of long because there's a lot of ground to cover with this instrument, but as you'll see, it's quite interesting ground. Anyway, I'll put some time codes down below so you can skip ahead if you want to. Now, even if you don't have the Continuum Lab instrument kit, you should be able to make one of these anyway. You'll just have to source some stuff yourself, some electronics and materials, and uh, download the code from the link in the description. Both of these instruments also use the Continuum Lab instrument kit breakout board, but the Clixophone can certainly be made without that if you have the skills. This other version of the Clixophone is an example of that, and I will cover its construction in a separate video. But if you do have the Continuum Lab instrument kit, then you already have all of the electronics and sensor materials that you need for this build, plus of course the uh, microcontroller with the code already on it for this instrument and a bunch more. So if you want to get your own click and come play along, then head on over to continuumlab.com where you will find it in the shop. Okay, enough about that, let's get building. <laughs> Okay, so as always, let's have a look at our materials. Here on your left side, we have some tools. This first build is really simple. We won't even need the soldering iron. Then here in the middle, we have some materials that come with the complete Continuum Lab instrument kit. Electronics, connections, some cables here, the breakout board. We have some thumbtacks that we'll use to make some keys. And then over on the other side, we have some construction materials that you'll have to provide. Uh, mainly some corrugated cardboard here. And then we have some uh, electrical tape and the top of a water bottle. So the first thing that I want to show you how to make is the uh, breath sensor. We're going for a simple breath sensor design. In this case, we're using the top of this water bottle here. And uh, I want to cut this down to size, making sure that I leave a slanted edge here at the top without any sharp bits. And then we're going to use this balloon here as a membrane. And this uh, black balloon is adequate for the job because it has this white print on it. Because this sensor uh, uses a CNY70 module which measures the expansion of that membrane as we blow into the breath sensor. And so we need uh, the CNY70 to be able to reflect its light off of something on the balloon and this white print that this balloon has works great for that. So then we cut open the balloon and we apply it to the uh, bottle top here as a membrane with um, a slight tension on it, not too much, or you'll have to blow really hard in the sensor to make it work. Next we need to make some holes for actually blowing in the sensor and uh, let me just mark some spots here on the bottle cap. I'm going to, uh, in this case, actually make the holes through this edge here that you see on the, on the edge of the inside of the uh, bottle cap. And uh, that's going to make it not seal perfectly once we're done with the construction, but that's not really a problem here. This sensor is actually going to be external to the instrument, so we don't have any humidity or air escaping inside the instrument, which can cause problems. So uh, I do this because it's more comfortable to blow directly into the sensor if the hole is right on the edge. So what I do here is I make uh, two different sizes of hole. The larger one is for blowing into and the smaller one is the air escape hole to let the pressure equalize so you can blow continuously. Now you can see that when I blow into the large hole we get this nice expansion of the balloon membrane and at the same time the air is escaping through that smaller hole. So you can play with the proportion between these two holes to get different results. Now we need to uh, put 
the CNY70 into place and we want to put it right in front of the membrane with maybe about 8 to 10 millimeters distance. That's a, a good adequate distance for measuring the reflection off of that white print there. So we need to build a structure for this and of course I'm just going to use some of this corrugated cardboard for that. And so while I'm making this uh, breath sensor setup here, I'm also considering where it's going to uh, fit into the final instrument. And uh, seeing as we're making a saxophone analog sort of instrument, I'm going to make some vaguely saxophone shaped um, cardboard version here. And that means that I'm going to make a neck and the neck is also going to be the container for the breath sensor. So that's what I'm doing right now. Uh, crushing one side of the corrugation here um, is uh, going to make it much easier to roll this piece of cardboard into a round shape and that's going to be um, great for fitting around this bottle top. Now I'm just going to trim down this balloon here because it kind of gets in the way. Uh, this is optional, it makes it more difficult to remove the membrane and put it back on if you need to, but uh, in this case I'm just going to get rid of it. And then uh, now you can see how crushing one side of that corrugation has made it easy to make this perfectly round shape around the um, bottle top. So I'm going to hold this together with a rubber band because uh, I don't want to glue this. We want to be able to take it apart and put it back together again. And now I need to consider how to put the CNY70 module into this. And uh, so I need to hold this at a, at a fixed distance from the membrane, which is going to help me to uh, get stable readings. And uh, so I'm going to mark the position of the bottle top that I want so that we have some of the bottle cap uh, extending beyond the edge of the cardboard and then I'm going to mark the distance that I want down to the center. So around, I think that would be around 9 millimeters in this case. And then I'm marking uh, separately here where that then puts the base of the sensor module. So that's that mark there. Next I want to um, make another strip of cardboard. Uh, the specific proportions here don't really matter but what I'm going to do is I'm going to fit this inside the other circular structure and that's going to make an edge on the inside of that first tube. So I need to prepared in the same way as the other piece so that I can roll it up nice and round and uh, then I'm going to make a let's call it a lid that's where the sensor module is actually going to fit on and that's going to go behind that inner rim you'll see how this all fits together in a second so I'm making a circular piece of cardboard here which is going to fit inside the initial tube and that's going to have the sensor module on it so I need to make a hole uh, in here where the cable and the plugs on the sensor module are going to fit through Mind you, this doesn't go in the middle because we want the sensor to be in the middle where the balloon expansion is uh, largest. And so we need to put those, uh, the hole for the cable a little bit off to the side. I don't really measure this out in millimeters. I just put the sensor on there and figure out where I need to make the holes. And of course, uh, I've already glued the sensor in place here with hot glue, which is going to help stabilize everything. So now I'm putting this uh, piece of round cardboard inside the initial tube structure just to check the position. It goes where I made that last mark, which is where the base of the sensor needs to go. It seems to be just the right size. And so now here around the edge, um, on the actual top surface of the instrument, not on the outside edge, I'm going to glue that extra strip of cardboard which uh, I just made before. And that's going to make sure that that also fits into my initial tube shape, which of course was um, basically defined by the size of the bottle top. So then I'm going to glue that down on top there. Might have a little bit left over, so then I just cut that off. It doesn't need to be super precise. Uh, we just want to make sure that there's a strong support for the bottle top so that it stays in place. And that, of course, it has to be open in the middle where the uh, balloon membrane is going to be expanding towards the sensor module. So that's how this whole breath sensor works, as I mentioned, by the expansion of that uh, balloon membrane. So now I'm sticking on some extra glue here, making everything nice and stable. And then uh, once I'm ready, I'm going to insert this whole structure into the larger tube. And uh, I am going to glue this in place, but of course keep in mind I want to be able to open this up so that I can manage the bottle top sensor and all that. I'm going to ultimately hold it closed with um, a rubber band. So I'm only applying glue to about half of the um, circumference of this inner tube section. As you can see here, then I'm gluing it into place. That looks nice. And uh, then now I'm ready to uh, shut it and uh, hold it closed with the rubber band. And as you can see, the bottle top still fits, fits nicely in there and the edge of that bottle top that has the balloon membrane on it now rests firmly on the um, top edge of that inner structure that we made. And then of course uh, we plug in the cable, 
close everything up finally and now we're basically ready to go and as i mentioned this is going to basically be like the neck structure of our sa saxophone emulator shape here and so we still need to make the main body um of this instrument and i'm going to use the same technique i normally do for these things i'm going to make a roughly sort of box shaped tube out of uh, corrugated cardboard again i'm crushing some of the corrugation making it really easy to fold this into kind of sturdy um, structures and as always i'm not measuring this by centimeters but rather by sections of the corrugation as you can see the middle here has four empty waves of corrugation and then i crush the fifth one the side ones have three empty sections and i crush the fourth one this might vary if you have different sizes of uh, cardboard and that's why i'm not giving you precise measurements here so um, what i'm doing here is i'm making a section which will be large enough to hold the breakout board and that's the first thing that I cut out. This is also going to kind of double as the bell part of the, let's say, <clears throat> saxophone. And uh, I realize this is not going to be like a super beautiful saxophone shape, but we're going for something which roughly emulated and is kind of recognizable. So you'll see how that uh, goes in a second. So um, now I'm going to uh, remove some of the material here. The top part of the instrument is going to be this roughly uh, square tube, and so I don't need this section. I'm going to leave five sections of roughly the same width so that I can fold that into a square shape with one part uh, overlaid double. And now what I'm doing here is I'm cutting out. This cutout here is meant for the uh, next section that we just made. And uh, you can see where I'm cutting that out. Now I'm going to fold it up and you can see where that goes. So there you go. Now we have our roughly uh, square tube with the sort of bell section at the end where the breakout board goes and then the neck fits in here uh, up at the top. So as you can see, I'm, comp I'm compressing the neck slightly at the end where it fits in here. That's not a problem at all. That part is only structural. The breath sensor itself is independent of that. So now I'm... Uh, figuring out exactly where to put the breakout board and uh, I'm making an, an, uh, an additional bend here to make uh, to construct sort of the outside edge of the instrument and um, I don't want to this to be too much larger than it has to be because that uh, will uh, make it a little bit less stable so you can see that the breakout board is part way into the square part let's say of the tube and then fits out with about half of its width out onto the uh, bell section and now I'm just uh, applying a little bit of hot glue three large drops of hot glue here and I'm gluing the breakout board down this is what I always do it's just the easiest way to uh, fix these in place and if I need to remove it the hot glue is not hard to remove from the breakout board afterwards so uh, now I'm grabbing the TNC uh, microcontroller from uh, the previous instrument that I made which was the C board you can go check out that build video and uh, of course these uh, microcontrollers have all of the instruments programmed onto them so I'm simply taking it out of one instrument putting it into the other and uh, that's going to work just fine as you'll see a little bit later good so now I'm uh, getting rid of a little bit of surplus material here just to get a neater look and then I'm also going to hold this lower section of the instrument closed with a rubber band so now we have our basic shape and hopefully you can see what I mean when I say that this is roughly saxophone shaped. And uh, I think now it's time to figure out where we're going to put the keys. So that's what you see me doing here. I'm sort of holding it, trying to measure with my hand where everything goes. And at this moment, I realize that the neck is still just loose. It's just put in there and uh, it will fall out as soon as I start messing around with this instrument and so I'm just going to glue it into place I'm going to make sure that I only glue it on the two side pieces of the main body because I want to make sure that I can still just unfold this corrugated cardboard open it up and uh, access all the cables and stuff inside so uh, that's what's going on here and I'm just gonna put a little bit of extra hot glue on the inside edges here I want to keep this pretty um, sturdy and fixed in place here so there you go now that is uh, pretty strong as uh, far as cardboard constructions go and uh, I'm ready to start figuring out where the uh, the keys go and so again I'm not measuring this with a ruler or anything I'm putting my fingers on the instrument and I'm um, going to put those keys on there where my fingers find it most comfortable 
Now, the Clixophone has 13 keys on the front and 3 octave keys here in the back. And there, there are two reasons for those numbers. First of all, the 13 keys roughly correspond to something that works like a saxophone. And of course, the 16 total keys corresponds to the 16 contacts on the multiplexers that I use. <laughs> So uh, in this first simple build here, we're going to make some extra super simple capacitive keys. And for that, we're going to use these thumbtacks, which I've selected for their exact size or rather the thickness of the pin on them, uh, which can be plugged directly into a DuPont cable. So we won't need to solder anything. What we do need to do is remove the plastic layer on here. Uh, we will apply our own plastic layer. And the problem with this initial one, which is on the thumbtack, is that it's kind of loose and it wobbles around. So we just get rid of it. And uh, then we have these sort of virgin thumbtacks here. Then I'm going to make a hole on uh, each mark that I made for the keys. And uh, I, I'm just using this tool that I happen to have lying around. You could use a pencil or some other uh, pointy object. And then uh, we're going to need some cables. So I'm just taking some whole um, DuPont cables here. And uh, there's no need to... Uh, do any work on them, solder or anything, and then I'm just inserting the thumbtacks individually each into a DuPont cable. And uh, then for the dielectric layer on each key, I'm going to use some electrical tape. This could be any sort of uh, plastic sticky tape. Um, we just need to isolate the metal of the thumbtack from our finger because we don't want direct conduction. We are only going to measure the electrical field of the player's body which is what these capacitive keys on the Teensy microcontroller can do really easily. So then we're inserting the individual keys into the uh, instrument body here through the holes from the outside. And uh, then what I'm going to do here in this case is hot glue each key into place. And uh, now this is going to also get a bit of glue onto the cable. It will make it really hard to disassemble this construction afterwards. But you could make this instrument without gluing these in. But uh, I plan on keeping this in the shape that it has right now, and so I'm just gluing everything into place. So then I'm just making sure that the inside here is uh, well stabilized. I don't want these cables to come loose. And this might be a little bit uh, overkill, but, you know, um, better safe than sorry. So yeah, get a bit of hot glue on the inside there, and that'll keep the cable in a stable position, um, even when I close it up. And then I just realized that I forgot a key. So uh, right in here between what it would be the B and the A keys, uh, if this were a saxophone, uh, is the B flat key. So if you know saxophonish, there's two ways to play a B flat, and this little key here is one of them. So uh, I forgot that. Not a big problem. I'll just make an extra hole, uh, you know, insert the key. And uh, as you can see, I'm making quick work of this. One thing to keep in mind is the distance between these three back keys. They need to be comfortable for your thumb to play either one of them or two of them together. So the spacing will depend on the size of your thumb, basically. If you have big, fat thumbs like me, then you can space them out a little bit more. And so now all the keys are on there, and I'm basically ready to um, get the multiplexer and start plugging the keys in. So like I mentioned, there are 16 contacts on the multiplexer. These are all numbered. And so what I like to do is I like to number the... Uh, the uh, contacts on the instrument. So that's what I'm going to do now. And what you just saw me do before was checking the uh, old prototype of the Clixophone, which is where I initially made this design and the electronics connection, and uh, just getting the numbers from there. <laughs> So now I'm finishing up the numbering here. We start with the zero on the top key on the front surface, and then we end with 15 on the bottom of the octave section, the lower of the three keys. So one more thing I need to do is I'm going to trim down the inside of that neck section a little bit because all of that cardboard there in this rigid structure is interfering with the uh, some of the cables here on the inside of the instrument. So that's not a problem. Uh, it's glued into place and will hold its place just fine. So then now I'm deciding where to put the multiplexer. I want to make sure that it doesn't interfere with the keys uh, or the inside of the keys, all those cables coming in. So it's going down at the bottom here next to the breakout board. Before I glue it in, I'm actually putting the eight contact DuPont cable in um, just so I'm sure that everything will fit together nicely. And then I'm gluing this into the, uh, to the inside of the structure of the instrument. 
on what is the rear surface which is furthest away from where we have most cables coming through so then um, now I'm ready to start plugging in the keys and this is really plugged by numbers you just check the number on the instrument uh, or on each individual cable and then you find that position on the multiplexer and you plug it in there the click software is going to take care of uh, all the rest of figuring out what each key is doing and um, how that's supposed to work so uh, once um, we finish plugging everything in here I'm going to uh, close up the instrument and see how everything looks and at this point I'm sort of thinking that it might have been a good idea to use some shorter cables at least for the keys which are close to the multiplexer just because it would mean having less mass of copper <laughs> wire inside this instrument because that can actually cause some crosstalk between cables but in the case of the clixophone of course we're interpreting these keys in a binary fashion and so a little bit of noise between keys is not a problem and as you can see the instrument actually closes up just fine and now I'm uh, this time I'm doubling up the rubber band to give a little bit more tension in, in order to keep everything closed. And you can put the rubber band anywhere you want. Make sure that it's not on top of any of the keys, which might uh, get in the way as you're playing. So then uh, we want to close this other section up as well and just have a look at our creation so far. Okay, so uh, yeah, I'm feeling really good about that. There's one thing that would make this much more comfortable to play, and that's a thumb support. So now I'm marking the position that I want my thumb to be at, the top surface of my thumb. And I'm going to fold this thumb support, uh, no big surprise, out of the same corrugated cardboard that I use to uh, make, the main, make the main body. And I'm going to do some, some double structures here, as you can see, uh, to make this extra strong, because that's, of course, the part that I'm going to sort of be handling a lot. And you could do any sort of structure here. You could roll up a little cylinder and just stick that on there. It could be a totally different material. The important thing is you need something sturdy th so that the instrument can rest on your thumb and give you a more stable position. Excellent. That's looking really good and sort of vaguely saxophone-like. So the last thing we need to put in here is the calibration button. And I'm going to use one of these modules which has the pins pointing downwards from the module and that's because I'm going to put the button on the outside of the instrument and so I want the cables to disappear straight into the instrument. So I'm just marking a place here on the back uh, surface below, well below the thumb support and I'm making a hole for the cable to fit through. Then um, I will first pull the cable through and plug the cables into the calibration connector on the breakout board. Fold that cable up sort of neatly more or less and then uh, I'll close it up again and now I can then connect the actual module plug that into these two cables here of course the polarity doesn't matter because this is just ground to a digital pin so uh, doesn't matter one way or the other and then I'll glue the module down um, on the back surface here with a little bit of hot glue and uh, that's it the instrument is done as you can see uh, this is obviously a prototype everything's kind of rough around the edges but very much functional. Um, so now the next thing that we want to do is plug this into the computer and see if everything works. So, as you've just seen, this first Clixophone build works so much better than it looks, which is totally fine for a prototype as far as I'm concerned. It's quick and responsive both in the breath sensor and in the keys. Uh, as always, the information specifically on how to calibrate and play the Clixophone, uh, such as what key combinations correspond to what notes and all of that, will be in a separate companion video, so there will be a link to that down in the description. But for now, we still have more work to do. The next build is going to explore all of the different options of the Clixophone, including pitch bend and extra keys, as well as incorporating some fancier build techniques such as 3D printing. So let's get on with that.
So, ready to get started on the second Clixaphone build. So, um, on your left here, you can see the tools, just like before. Um, pretty much the same, except that this build is going to be a little bit more complex, and we will be using the um, soldering iron for this. Then here in the middle, we have um, some of the stuff that comes with the complete version of the Continuum Lab instrument kit. Specifically, we have some um, DuPont cables, a bunch of those. Those are used to connect the sensor modules and the keys. Then we have some copper tape, two different sizes of silicone tube, food grade silicone tube, and then various electronics, sensor modules, uh, multiplexer, microcontroller, and of course the click breakout board. And then over here on the uh, your right side of the screen, we have the stuff that you will need to supply to this build if you decide to make this kind of prototype. And so there's a lot of interesting stuff here, 3D prints, there's some uh, keys that we'll have a look at in a second, some um, polypropylene for the main structure. And uh, then, as um, you can see here, we have the same kind of breath sensor that we used in the previous build already constructed. So I'm not going to show you again how to make holes in a bottle top. Uh, this is exactly the same kind of, um, of uh, idea as we saw in the previous build even the same exact kind of balloon and so that's going to work exactly the same as the other one what's different is that this time we've printed a support for the bottle top so you can see this is a two-piece print and the bottle top fits inside it like this so we need to cut the bottle top to the right size so that it fits in there and then uh, inside uh, these two printed pieces we can fit the uh, sensor module the CNY70 sensor module and as you can see here I also have a um, a version of this 3D print which has a 45 degree bend which is going to put the uh, blow hole of the breath sensor at a different angle to your mouth. So we'll have a look at both of those a little bit further on. Excellent. So then we have some other 3D printed pieces here. These are some of my box end designs uh, reminiscent of these uh, seaboard box ends here. Actually exactly the same except more narrow. These are about 68 millimeters wide, I think. Now, these seaboard ones uh, had a 8 millimeter breath hole in the end, but this one has a larger hole, and we'll see how that works a little bit later on. Of course, there's also these ones that I made for the Melodica. Again, a slightly different size. One of them has a also a larger hole, but this one is kind of different because it has these locking um, protrusions here on the... Uh, on the mouthpiece, which means that you can lock it in place in the box end, which is very handy. So we're going to have a look at how all of that works later on. Then here we have um, a whole bunch of keys. These are two-piece prints. So there's a disc that goes inside a cylinder. And the cylinder has a raised edge at the top so that the disc will not fall out um, off the top of the key. And so we end up with a raised key structure. We're going to put some, some uh, conductive material on the top surface of the disc and then we're going to put a dielectric layer on top of that, and then we're going to insert them inside these cylinders. Here we have a thumb support, which is what we folded out of cardboard in the previous build. This one is 3D printed. And then we have this cool triple key here. This is, of course, for the um, thumb section where we do the octave selection. And you can see these have we have these kind of dome-shaped keys on there. We're going to see how all of this works in a little bit. But what we're going to start with today is this large piece of corrugated polypropylene. As you can see, this is what they also call fluted plastic. And uh, it has this structure similar to the corrugated cardboard so that we'll be able to fold it uh, easily around the uh, structure of this box and here making a nice box shape. <laughs> Like I mentioned, we'll start this second build by making the complete instrument with a mouthpiece that's similar to what we did in the first build. More fancy with 3D printing, but it still uses a plastic bottle top. Then at the end, we'll assemble and apply this more advanced mouthpiece, which includes pitch bend sensors. If you want to skip straight to that, you can do that using the time codes below. So for this second build, we are going to start with the construction of the main body, and for that we're going to make um, a piece of polypropylene, roughly square, 25 by 25 centimeters. And um, that's going to allow us to fold it around the box end here. Um, so as you can see, this uh, this 3D print has some cutouts around the edge, and that's where the, uh, the sheet material is going to fit into. So the way we're going to make this work is we're going to um, work this 
plastic material, kind of like we did the cardboard. So I'm going to prepare one side of the, the corrugation. I'm going to remove some sections of corrugation on one side. Uh, I'm marking sort of a width here based on the width of the box end. And then with a um, short Stanley knife blade here, I'm cutting out just one side of the polypropylene along those three corrugation sections. And that's going to allow me to bend it out like that, and then I can remove the um, leftover material like this. Make, be careful with this, don't cut your fingers. Now, I can't give you the exact measurements for this because the uh, polypropylene material comes in different corrugation sizes, and so the same thickness of material might have four millimeter wide corrugation sections or five millimeter and so you'll just have to hold the material up to the box end once you print it out and check the width that you need and then um, make the cutouts exactly like i'm doing here and pay attention i'm not actually measuring the width of these yeah i'm actually just doing it by eye against the printed piece and then and then i'm counting the um, corrugation sections so but again, uh, you can't really trust those numbers because the material is not always the same from the factory. So um, again, I'm doing this um, all the way around the box end. And um, then the final cut here, I'm actually just going to remove this bit of material. This is left over. So the final piece isn't exactly 25 centimeters wide. It's a little bit less. But again, your mileage may vary. And uh, so this is how I figured it out. And now I can just test that everything fits around the box end nicely and uh, the final piece here on the end is uh, sort of a flap that's going to actually fit inside the instrument and uh, so I'm going to have to remove a little bit of material on that part and that's what I'm marking in here so this is going to be the same width as the uh, edge uh, section on each box end piece so I'll just remove this section completely and that's going to allow this last section to fit inside the um, the whole structure once I'm done. So this might sound a little bit mysterious to you right now, but um, it'll be pretty easy to see how it all fits together once uh, I get started gluing it together. So now I'm scoring the edges of the inside of my polypropylene here and this is going to help the hot glue that I use to glue everything together to have some more surface area to hold on to, which is quite important because uh, this doesn't chemically bond the polypropylene and it also it's not the hot glue is not hot enough to actually melt the polypropylene, so we need some mechanical force here. And so scoring it helps a lot. First I put a bead of hot glue onto the, um, onto the 3D print and then I'm going to bend the, uh, the polypropylene into shape and then I'm just going to put that uh, 3D printed piece on there I'm going to hold everything in place while that glue sets. So I'm just removing a little bit of extra glue here. We don't want glue inside the part that's going to fold next. So once that's set, and I'm sure it's set really well, um, we can move on to the other side. I'm going to put some glue on the same two sections of the 3D print and do the exact same operation. You want to make sure that these are properly set because the polypropylene wants to unfold. And so we need to make sure that we're holding that together. Excellent. Now, to make extra sure that this bend is nice and solid, I'm going to put some hot glue on the inside of the bend where I removed some material from the polypropylene. And it's going to help to solidify that bend a lot. And uh, then I'm gluing the third side of the fold and I'm putting a little bit of uh, glue first on the 3D prints and this time also on the polypropylene on the inside of it. Don't put on too much because, as I just did here, we'll get a hot glue spilling out the sides which is a bit of a mess. So this is all that we need to glue to make this body. The rest of, of the polypropylene is going to work as a lid and now you see why I removed a little bit of that section there. It fits perfectly inside the, um, the uh, structure and uh, that flap as I like to call it just disappears into the instrument and it uh, helps to hold everything shut. Excellent, so now on the lid the lid is actually the bottom side of the instrument, and that's where I'm going to put the um, the uh, breakout board. And uh, as you can see, that fits nicely onto there. So then the other side, of course, is the front or top side of the instrument, and that's where our 13 keys are going to go. Then on the back side, which is the lid, of course, I'm going to put the octave keys. So once again, I'm not measuring this with the ruler. Again, I'm just putting my fingers on there and determining uh, comfortable positions for my hands. I have pretty large hands, not enormous, but 
uh, I like a little bit of distance in between the keys. So then I'm just uh, taking a marker here and I'm marking those positions with a dot. Now this gets a little difficult sometimes. I mean, I need one hand to be making the marks, so uh, so then the other hand can hold the box and then whatever, it works. First time I didn't really get it right and so I go back and try again. Important to test this, actually put the keys on there and then just see how everything feels under your fingers. And remember that, of course, between two of those top keys, namely the B and A keys, you have the little B flat key. So if you have these printed keys, you need to make sure that that actually fits in there. And then, uh, of course, I also need to put the, um, the um, octave keys on there. So I'm marking the position of that once I figure out where I want it to go. And I'm just roughly marking that because, of course, they're not individual keys. There's this whole section here that uh, goes on there. Good. So now this is a bit nerve-wracking because there's no uh, undo button on this process, but I do need to make some holes for the cables to go through. So I'm, I'm using the same tool as before, but I'm taking a little bit of extra care here to make the holes a little bit larger because um, this instrument is a bit smaller than the actual DuPont cable headers. And so I need to just expand that a little bit more because the material is much tougher, of course, than cardboard. And so I won't be able to just force the cables through. So, um, okay, I'm having one last look at how those keys look. And then here comes uh, something that is a little bit different in this second build. And that is an expansion option, something that you can choose to do or not on your instrument. And that is that there's a set of extra keys. And we'll get to how those work uh, at the end of the video, but we need to fit those somewhere where I can actually reach them while I'm still playing the other keys. So I'm trying a couple of different options here, and I end up putting these on the side of the instrument. And uh, so I'll be playing these either with the side of one finger or with the thumb. I'll show you at the end. Now, uh, the design actually ended up only having four keys instead of the uh, six ones that I have on here. So just keep that in mind. Uh, this early prototype had six keys, but the final design of the Clixophone only allows four side keys. So then the camera cut out while I was making the holes for those, but as you can see on this clip, the holes are indeed made exactly the same as the other ones. So then uh, I also want to figure out uh, where to put the thumb support, and uh, that's easy enough. I'm making a few holes for this because I'm also going to hot glue that on there, and I need to have a lot of um, surface area for this to be a strong bond so that I can uh, rest the instrument on my thumb with confidence. Okay, so having a last look at all those holes, I think that looks pretty good, and now I'm ready to actually prepare the keys. So uh, this is a bit of a lengthy operation and uh, can be maybe, let's say, a little bit tedious. You need to repeat some of these operations for every single key, so, you know, but that's what we need to do, so let's just get started. Now, as I mentioned, we're covering up each disc in the, in the keys, individual keys, with a piece of copper tape, which is going to be our capacitive sensor electrode. So I'm making some square pieces here, um, which are just a little bit larger than the disc. Don't make them too large, or you will have a lot of extra copper material inside each key, which will be uh, just get in the way. So then uh, we start gluing that onto the discs. Now keep uh, an eye on these discs here. They actually have a an edge around the bottom, and we need to put the copper tape on the top so that's going to fit inside the rage raised edge on each key cylinder and it's going to hold everything in place um, so let's see now we need to prepare some cables we're going to solder these cables onto this copper tape so that means that we need to grab as many cables as we have keys and we need to um, strip the end of the cable and then uh, of course get a little bit of solder on each cable. Then we need to put a little bit of solder on the copper tape. So we need to make sure that we have at least a little corner of it stuck out uh, from the plastic so that we don't melt the plastic if we solder. And then we just solder the cable onto there. It's super easy to solder onto this copper tape, especially if you tint both surfaces first. Then I'm going to cut out a little square again, uh, slightly larger than the copper tape one. I'm going to trim the corners on that. And this is electrical tape, and that's going to be our dielectric layer. So we put that on there, and we just fold the edges back over the disc. And I'm sorry, that wasn't very obvious here in the camera, but I'm just folding that electrical tape back and then um, inserting the, uh, the key disc into the key cylinder, which leaves the, uh, the uh, surface of the disc flush with the top of the cylinder. So hopefully you can see how that works. It's not necessarily very complicated to do, but there's a good few of these keys here. So, uh, you know, just 
<laughs> just get on with it. Next, we do exactly the same with the octave keys here, but those are sort of dome shaped. So we need to make sure that we put the copper tape on there and then sort of try to smooth it out to get a nice surface on there. Um, other than that, the operation is exactly the same. You can see me smoothing out some creases there and then soldering the cable to that, just like I did with the other ones. And then again, I'm putting some electrical tape on top. I'm using a different color here, but that, of course, doesn't really matter. Those are just aesthetic choices. And then once I get that on there, I can again insert that whole key uh, into the structure of the octave key support. And then we get this sort of raised dome here, which is going to be nice and tactile for your thumb so that you can feel where your position is if you're touching one of these or two of them together. And we'll have a look at how that works at the end. Excellent. So I'm using a tool to just press these into place because depending on the precision of your 3D prints, they might sort of fit a little bit better or a little bit worse. Okay, so now the keys are done and they feel kind of good. But if I just put them on the instrument like this, the most probable outcome is that the disc will fall out of this cylinder. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm inserting a little bit of hot glue into the inside of the cylinder to, to uh, cover the disc and all the tape and all that stuff and the cable. And then I'm, um, I'm flattening it with my finger. Now you can, you can uh, manipulate um, hot glue with your finger if you get your finger wet first, as you can see me doing here on the soldering sponge. Just get a little bit of water on your finger and then you can squeeze the hot glue down. And what that's going to do is it's going to squeeze it out to the sides and it's going to go up flush against the cylinder, grabbing onto the 3D printed layer lines on the cylinder print. And uh, that means that you're going to stabilize everything that's inside the cylinder. So the disc is going to be held in place and the tape is going to be held in place and so will the cable. And um, that's a pretty good solution for this, unless you want to get into some really complicated 3D prints that might have some kind of locking system for each key. But these are tiny things and it's kind of hard to print something uh, that will work on that level, especially when you need to cover it up with copper tape and electrical tape and all that. So then I do exactly the same thing with three octave keys. Again, uh, not very complicated, but kind of tedious because there's just so many of these keys and, uh, you know, they uh, all have the same basic process. And that's actually it. I'm done with all the keys. Uh, I've connected all the cables to each key and uh, I think everything's ready to start assembling the keys onto the instrument. But first I need to just figure out where each individual key goes. Now I have a couple of different key designs here. Some of them are slanted to the side, some of them are smaller and larger. This is totally up to you how you want to distribute these inside the instrument. But what you do need to do is number the position of the keys, which again is going to make it much easier to plug everything into the multiplexer. Let's have a look at those key positions. <laughs> Of course, we don't have any positions left on the multiplexer, so the side keys go directly onto the breakout board uh, in the numbering that you just saw a second ago. Okay, so now I'm so starting to insert the individual keys into the holes here, pulling those through and getting the keys into position. So uh, rather than insert everything and then sticking them down, I'm actually going to insert each one, and then again I'm going to hot glue it down to the surface. And I'm making a couple of extra holes next to the hole, the cable hole for each, and that's just, again, to help the hot glue keep everything in place. Don't uh, use too much hot glue or it's going to spill out the size of the key and it's going to uh, be a little bit messy. So just try to regulate your hot glue use here. Uh, that one looks pretty good. So now I'm uh, going down one by one. As you can see, the key here for the B flat is smaller than the other ones. As I mentioned, I have a few different designs. You can find all of these in the link in the description, you can download the 3D models. You can see some of them have a slant towards the side. I'm using those for the keys that uh, I play with the side of the fingers. You'll see how that works at the end of the video. Of course, you could just use one key design and uh, put the same kind of key everywhere. Good, so now all of the top key cables are inserted and the keys are fixed in place. Uh, next, I'm doing the side keys. These are all uh, the small 3D model, so the small design. Again, that's uh, totally arbitrary. You can just use whatever you want. And uh, so I do exactly the same operation there. And then, of course, for the um, octave keys, all of the three keys go in together because what I'm going to do here is I'm going to glue the whole 
octave key section down as one piece. So first I'll just get a little alcohol, clean off those uh, marks that I made before to find the position, then prepare the surface for the hot glue, and then I'll apply some, uh, some hot glue here and then just glue the whole piece down. Make sure you're kind of quick about this because if you wait too long the hot glue will already set and uh, the piece won't go flush with the surface and you'll have a sort of raised octave key section which doesn't look very good. And uh, you know, make this as neat as you want to. I'm trying to make sure the piece is stuck on there more or less straight. And then finally we need to glue the thumb rest down. I already made some extra holes to prepare the surface here for the hot glue. I'm also inserting some hot glue into the inside of this 3D print and around the edge um, enough to make a good contact here but of course not so much that it spills out a lot to all sides and as you can notice here I'm actually taking the sort of wider piece of the base and putting it away from where my thumb goes that's not to put my thumb on that's actually just to give some extra surface area and hold everything extra stable Okay, so we're done with the cables. Uh, what a mess, but you know, that's just sort of what we need to do. There's a lot of cables in here, and um, so uh, this is what that looks like. We'll organize those in a bit, and of course to organize those we need to get the electronics where we'll plug them in. That's the multiplexer and the click breakout board. Plus, of course, a cable, eight contact DuPont cable, or eight separate DuPont cables to connect these two pieces. So, okay, this is not where the breakout board goes. It actually goes on the part that's the lid, okay? Uh, we want to get it away from where the, all the cables, main section of cables come through, and we want to make sure that the uh, micro USB cable can fit through and uh, will always find that plug on the microcontroller. So that's why we're putting this glue on here while the USB cable is plugged in, and then we're closing the lid of the instrument over the breakout board uh, so that the base of it will co make contact with that lid section, and then we will uh, hold that there for a second while the glue sets. And then, uh, you know, a minute later, when we can tell from the USB cable that everything is kind of solid, then we can unplug that. And now the uh, breakout board is in position. So now it's fixed on there. Uh, as you can see, it's sort of raised off the edge here. And that's because this early version of the 3D printed box end has the hole a little bit too far away from the lid. Now this has been fixed in later versions, so if you download this from the link in the description, it will fit a little bit better. But of, of course this is all self-correcting, so if you just use that box end to measure, then your um, breakout board will be in the right position. Now I'm inserting the, uh, the calibration button module into the cutout that the box end has for that. I'm using a little bit of hot glue, uh, making sure to not get any hot glue on the actual button section, which would not allow it to work. And then I'm just uh, plugging the double DuPont cable into there and then plugging it into the calibration um, connector on the breakout board. Okay, so that's the breakout board and the button module, but we still need to figure out where the multiplexer goes. So the first thing I'll do is I'll grab the, the connector here, eight contact DuPont cable and connect that to the multiplexer and then figure out where I can put this uh, multiplexer module without getting too much in the way of the cables um, because there's a lot of those in here so I picked out this spot here and I'm going to glue the multiplexer module down just like I do with everything and that's just going to help to keep it um, in place and uh, not rattle around inside the instrument and uh, then to make it easy to plug in the actual keys I'll just remove the uh, multiplexer connector here for a second and then I just start plugging the cables in of course following the numbering starting with zero at the top of the main front side key section and ending up with 15 down at the bottom uh, key from the octave keys. And then of course we have the extra cables from the side keys and those are going directly to the breakout board and in a second we'll get to the connection graphic again and I'll show you exactly where those plug in. Okay, excellent. So now everything's plugged in as far as the keys go. Let's close up the instrument. And uh, yeah, it's under a little bit of tension there from all the cables, but uh, it works pretty well. So now all that's left to do to be able to play this is actually put on a mouthpiece. And of course, uh, this uh, specific mouthpiece and breath sensor here is very simple. It fits into the, the, um, the hole here on the end of the instrument and uh, it locks into place right there. So we just need to prepare it with the CNY70 sensor module. As you can see, there's a cutout inside the uh, 3D print for that. 
and then we need to assemble it sort of around uh, around this um, this pressure chamber here which is made out of bottle top so if you cut out a bottle top in the right size then uh, that will fit around it just like that and you can hold those two pieces of the 3d print together with a rubber band and that's actually a pretty sturdy construction so then you insert it here you twist it to lock and um, that's looking really good and uh, yeah I like the position of the keys the feel of them everything's really nice but uh, I do have, as I showed you in the beginning, I do have another version of this breath sensor. So um, let's have a look at that as well. It's uh, basically the same construction, so I'll just put it together. And the only difference here is that it has a sort of a 45 degree bend in it, which puts uh, maybe the hole in the mouthpiece in a more um, suitable position. And uh, another problem here is that this print, again, an early version, it's a little bit too small around the edges, around the uh, where it fits into the hole. So I'm putting a little bit of hot glue on there just to uh, to um, to make some tension as I lock it into place in the box end. So uh, newer versions of this model have fixed that problem. So yeah, don't worry about that. Then I'm pulling the cables from the CNY70 sensor through and connecting them down at the breakout board. Okay, so I think it's time to have a good look at that connection graphic now and see where everything plugs in. Okay, so now everything is basically ready, but there's one thing that uh, I want to do, even though it's optional. I'm going to use a little bit of food grade silicone tube to make the mouthpiece a little bit easier to uh, deal with. In the mouth so I'm inserting one of the eight millimeter wide sections in the large hole that's going to make the entry hole smaller so then I also need to make the exit hole smaller so that I can still make useful pressure inside the pressure chamber and for that I'm using this five millimeter wide section and then I'm uh, bending that slightly larger tube section off to the side I'm holding it in place with a rubber band and so this is going to be uh, my final mouthpiece assembly I mean, except, of course, that I do have another design that I want to show you in a second, which has pitch bend functionality. But this one is the simple one based on the uh, bottle top breath sensor, which has super good sensitivity and responsiveness. So uh, let's first test this out, and then we can move on to the more advanced one afterwards. The only thing left to do is to connect this whole thing to the computer and see if everything works. <laughs> Okay, that works great. And as you can see, the uh, extra keys function completely independently from the rest of the clixophone with a velocity-driven output. Just now I was using that for a percussion patch, but in a second I'll show you how I use it to control my looper. But first, we still need to add the pitch bend interface. And to do that, of course, we're going to install a completely different mouthpiece. So let's do that. So that mouthpiece and breath sensor works really great. The bottle top is such a good solution for this. It's uh, very sensitive and responsive. Everything is contained outside of the instrument. There's never any problems with humidity getting close to your electronics. But what it doesn't have is pitch bend control. And I want to try that. So I have this other design which uh, uses these two pieces here. And if you look at it close up, you can see that there's a surface here and here. And that's where the upper and lower lip will go. And I'm going to put some capacitive sensors on there using this copper tape here underneath some food grade plastic. And that's what's going to allow me to generate the pitch bend signal. So uh, this setup is different than the bottle top setup in that the uh, mouthpiece and breath sensor are actually separate. So we just saw the uh, mouthpiece and pitch bend sensor. And the breath sensor is actually this 3D printed setup here, which is the same that I used in the Ocarina build video, in the Melodica build video and others. It uses the same sensor module, but uses a water balloon as a pressure chamber. 
Okay, so let's just get back to the mouthpiece section here for a second. Uh, we're going to need some materials for this. So, uh, as I mentioned, we need some food grade plastic for the front section where my lips are going to touch. I always get this from the same source. Uh, this is the lid from a food container. I'm just going to cut it out from there. Nice thin plastic, which is going to allow me to make good sensitive uh, capacitive sensors. We need some silicone tube and we need some different stuff here. I think it would actually be a good idea to just make a separate materials list for this specific kind of mouthpiece. And uh, so let's have a look at that. Okay, back to the breath sensor. So um, we also need a piece of food grade plastic for this breath sensor. Specifically, we need a disc which is going to fit inside the water balloon. It should be roughly the size of the inside surface of the 3D printed part here for the breath sensor. As you can see here, I'm just measuring that. It has a little bit of give, a little bit of play around there, which is nice. So we're going to bend this disc in the middle. Make sure you clean it well first. And then we're going to insert it into the water balloon. And then once we get it into the middle there, uh, to the end of it, we're going to unfold it again, and as you can see, that's sort of holding the balloon more or less uh, in a flat disc, and that means that it's going to expand a one across one dimension and not the other when I put pressure into it, like you can see here. So um, there's a little bit of um, loose material on the balloon here. That's actually not a problem um, as long as it's held in place comfortably in between these two pieces. You can see how it's sandwiched here and this is just going to stabilize it a lot. And then the CNY70 module fits in there and will be able to measure the distance to that balloon at all times. So when you blow in it, it will get a little bit closer uh, to the CNY70 module and uh, that's what we're measuring in the breath sensor. Good, next we need a larger piece of this same plastic and that's going to be uh, what fits over the outside of the mouthpiece. So it needs to be large enough to fit across both of these surfaces, as you can see here. And um, now I'm going to, of course, make a hole in this to fit the uh, breath tube through. But first, I want to make sure that I get the right dimensions roughly. So then before I've put everything together, of course, I need to make the capacitive sensors themselves. And they just consist in a cable running through here from the bottom to the top surface, a solder to a piece of copper tape. And the copper tape is what's going to be the sensor surface. So I'm going to stick that to the inside of that plastic. But first, I need to just figure out the size and shape of it. I'm going to cut it roughly to the shape of the um, this sort of um, half circle uh, part of the mouthpiece, as you can see here, making sure that it doesn't go over the edges. And then uh, I'm going to make sure that where there's a hole in that surface, we're actually going to fix, fix this in place with some M3 screws. And I want to make sure that there's a cutout in the copper tape so that it's not touching that screw. That's pretty important because that would just mean that the screw would become part of the sensor and that's way too much material for a good capacitive sensor. So that's what that ultimately looks like, making sure that you leave a little bit of gap around the uh, screw hole and then uh, you put the plastic on top of that. So then I'm just using one of these pieces to make a direct copy. So then I have two of them, one for each side. Next I found the uh, find the middle of this uh, plastic piece, the main plastic front end. And I'm making a 7 millimeter hole through here. Now you could use a drill for this. I prefer to use this uh, sort of uh, hole stamping tool here, which makes for a nicer finish. So we want kind of a nice finish on here because what we want is um, a hermetic seal, of course. We're going to be putting the breath tube through, as you can see here. And we want it to be kind of under tension. And we want to make very sure that we don't get any humidity coming through, uh, going in and touching the capacitive sensors. So next, I'll just simply bend this plastic piece here in the middle, which is going to uh, make sure that we can fit it around the mouthpiece, that sort of 45 degree angle on the mouthpiece. And that doesn't hurt the seal at all. It actually doesn't make much of a difference because the silicone tube is so flexible. So, okay, now we have the um, rough shape of that plastic and we're ready to fix it onto the mouthpiece. But first, I'm going to glue these two sections of the mouthpiece, mouthpiece together to make one uh, solid unit the reason why there's two pieces is because this uh, this structure with all these cutouts on the inside is much easier to print in two pieces and you get a much stronger finish, especially where the uh, screw holes go in. Because we don't have any nuts in here, we're just putting the screws directly into the 3D print. Okay, so now uh, we need to make some holes for the screws also in the plastic. And so I'm just putting the plastic into place 
marking more or less, uh, no, not more or less, I'm marking exactly where those holes go, and then I'm making those um, those holes into the plastic. Check out this technique here. Um, I'm just using a, a drill bit, but I'm using my hand um, to make the actual hole, because uh, if I put a drill on there and move it too fast, it, we might actually melt this plastic here. And then I'm just cutting off any excess bits of plastic with my Stanley knife, and now I'm ready to glue the copper tape onto the inside. Now you should have a little uh, flap on the corner of that st sticking off the plastic because we're going to have to still solder to this. And so we don't want to melt that plastic too much. Then I'm just t testing that the uh, M3 screw will fit through and that everything makes sense when I screw it into place. Yeah. There goes the second screw and yeah, that looks great. Uh, it doesn't have to be super, super precise or very flush to the mouthpiece uh, because the copper tape, of course, isn't stuck to the mouthpiece. It's actually stuck to the plastic uh, in front of it. So then I was just uh, marking the uh, actual edge that I'm going to cut off the plastic. As you can see, this square piece has these large corners sticking out. So I'm just going to cut those off and make everything a little bit more neat. And then I'm ready to actually solder some cables to these um, pieces of copper tape. Of course, make sure that you put the cables through the mouthpiece from the back. Uh, don't just solder them to the mouthpiece because you won't be able to get the uh, other end of the DuPont cable through that mouthpiece. So first we put the cables through from the back and then once they're out, we solder them to the copper tape. Now, uh, I should have raised this copper tape slightly off of the surface of the plastic because I'm actually sort of melting and deforming this plastic here, but um, it still works quite well. So that's not really a big problem. Um, make sure that you uh, put these cables in the right place. There is a cutout in the mouthpiece where you can fit a little bit of cable onto, but uh, if you solder them into the wrong place, then things are not going to be very neat and it's going to be quite hard to assemble this in the end. So then we do that to both of the uh, sensors and then we can screw those M3 screws back into place. And uh, there you go. So. Then now it's time to uh, put the silicone tube through. We need to put that through from the back side. And then it's kind of hard to get through here because, of course, it needs to be under tension in this hole here. I'm just putting some pressure from the back and then I'm grabbing it from the front and pulling it through. That's the easiest way to do that. And uh, that's basically the position I want. Looking great. So the last thing to do here is to uh, make a breath escape hole because this style of breath sensor doesn't have one. You actually need to make it in the silicone tube itself. So there's a hole in the mouthpiece for that, this square hole that you can see on the bottom of it. And I'm just using uh, this uh, tool here. I put a little bit of uh, marker paint on the tool and so I was able to mark a position on the tube. I'm just cutting a small hole using scissors here. Make sure that the hole you cut is slightly smaller than the inside diameter of the tube. It's just a small hole. We just need to make sure that we can blow through continuously instead of having to um, uh, take the air back into your mouth when you blow. That's very uncomfortable and not very natural. Okay, so um, yeah, this was kind of unnecessary. I'm putting the breath sensor in from the inside. It actually fits through the hole. I designed it specifically to fit through. So anyway, I'm putting the breath sensor in here and then I'm plugging the sensor cables in and then I'm assembling it with the mouthpiece afterwards, which makes it everything a little bit more difficult. But uh, yeah, you know, I can still make it work. Put the silicone tube in there. I'm using a tool this time to grab the silicone tube and, and pull it out so that uh, we get it through the front plastic cover. That's sort of tricky, but uh, you know, it's necessary. You need to have it through there and get a good hermetic seal to protect your sensors. So now we have this open hole here, which is where the hole with the air is going to escape through. And we can see that that uh, hole in the silicone tube fits exactly on there. So now what I want to do is I want to insert a little bit of material in here uh, just to um, collect any humidity that might drip out of that hole. This is not strictly necessary, but it actually makes just for sort of a neater setup. Make sure you don't put too much material in here because that will actually impede the flow of air and you definitely don't want that. So the final thing is to plug the breath sensor and capacitive sensors in. And to do that, I'm actually removing two of the side key cables here because the capacitive sensors take the place of those. And that's why I ended up in this instrument only giving the option to put on four side keys instead of the six that's on this prototype. <laughs> Thank you.
Okay, so now that everything's connected, we're ready to close up the clixophone and insert the mouthpiece. I can feel a little bit of resistance here, which I'm not happy with, so just open that up and check what's going on. Yeah, okay, you can see the breath sensor is all tangled up. Uh, the balloon is sort of like off. So, okay, I'm just going to take this out. I'm going to just reassemble it uh, exactly like before, but this time I'm going to insert it again with a little bit more care. Now, if you made this instrument larger, of course, it would be easy to fit everything inside. But, uh, you know, I like something that's comfortable to hold. So just take care as you insert all of this. You don't want the balloon to come loose inside the instrument. And uh, there you go. Okay, everything's assembled. Man, this has a lot of stuff going on. I can't wait to try it. Uh, the only thing left to do before I check it out is to connect it to the computer and see if all of these sensors work. And that's the Clixophone, saxophone fingerings, pitch bent, a highly capable interface that I'm really proud of to tell you the truth. I thought I'd just mention that even though I like to put the pitch bent sensors on the mouthpiece, they're really just capacitive sensors. You could put them somewhere else, like under your right thumb or anywhere else you prefer. Uh, to me, the mouthpiece is the most obvious place and makes for a very intuitive control. But of course, it also does add the complication of having to protect the sensors from humidity. So there is that. All of the instruments in the Continuum Lab instrument kit also have a companion video, which goes into much more detail about how to calibrate and play each instrument, as well as the different options and settings. So if you're curious about that, uh, there'll be a link in the description. And that's all I have for you this time. Go check out the other build videos and tutorials here on the channel. And don't forget, you can buy the complete kit, as well as various types of click instruments, including this cool updated version of the Clixophone over at ContinuumLab.com. Take care until next time. And I'll see you in the continuum.